Hello and welcome to News Central TV. I am Adebola Adedra. The headlines. Airline operators lament surge in price of fuel and unfriendly environment. Presidential candidates in Senegal lodge appeal against delayed election. The Air Congo's defense minister visits armed forces in Goma amidst increased fighting. Details shortly. We begin the news at this hour in West Africa, where Nigeria's Apex Bank says the nation's foreign exchange market is currently on a rebound as it has received over $1 billion in liquidity following strict policies put in place to stabilize foreign exchange rate. CBN Governor Ola Yemi Kadoso made this known during an interactive session with the Senate Committee on Banking, Insurance and other financial institutions aimed at updating lawmakers on reasons for the free fall of the Naira. Idong Joseph reports. The appearance of the senior officials of the nation's Apex Bank and members of Nigeria's economic team, including the Minister of Agriculture, is coming barely three days after the Senate had summoned the CBN governor to give an explanation of the state of the nation's economy. Lawmakers say they are determined to get to the root cause of the receding value of the Naira in the exchange markets so as to stop this downward trend. Responding to the myriad of economic challenges the country is currently facing, the governor of Nigeria's central bank says that comprehensive strategies have been put in place to address the current exchange rate volatility being witnessed. He says that with over $1 billion forex inflow in recent days, it is evident that the policies are working. For example, upwards of the past few days, we have had over $1 billion that have come into the market, over $1 billion. And this, quite frankly, is the answer to the question. Because we, the question was raised, was raised as to how do we know that your policies are working? And in fact, we were challenged to, to, to say that, in fact, they are not. And I would argue that with the numbers speaking and saying what is going on. He adds that for the measures to be sustainable at stopping the free fall of the Naira, Nigerians must reduce their appetite for the consumption of foreign-made goods and services. Honestly, CBN has no magic wand. We do not have. Our responsibility is in the process. If foreign exchange comes into us, we manage it in a way that is in best interest of the country and we do not have excessive volatility. Okay, that's one. Our, our, our argument on the demand side is that we as Nigerians also must work together to moderate demand. Where there are opportunities for us to substitute locally, so we should. On food security, the Minister of Agriculture blames the situation on the failure of the past administration to not plan properly for the wet season farming. Also, the Minister of Finance called for an open market, saying that measures must be put in place to prevent end market monopoly. I don't think there was any impact or any direct intervention by government for against the 2023 cultivation. Um, that also impacted on the, uh, the quantum of harvest that we had in 2023. At this period of reform and vulnerability, market capture, state capture, those with the power and dominance of markets should not be allowed to use that. With the Senate expressing worry over the situation in the country, as well as the free fall of the Naira, lawmakers seek quick solutions from the Apex Bank are needed to stabilize the Naira and restore confidence to the nation's economy. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idong Joseph. Unfriendly cost of air transportation in Nigeria may not be getting better anytime soon, as airline operators express concern over rising operational costs in addition to surge in price of aviation fuel. Aviation fuel now sells for 1,300 naira per litre. Spokesman of airline operators, Obiora Okonkwo, made this known in a statement on Friday. The operators trace the major challenge confronting the sector to fluctuation 
in foreign exchange, which has pushed one United States dollars to be exchanged for 1,400 Naira. Air passengers, according to the statement, are already exhausted and may not be able to meet up with any further increase in airfares. The statement urges immediate inter government intervention to save numerous airlines from total collapse. Senior Special Assistant to the President, Bola Chinobu, on the school feeding program, Yetunde Adeniji, says the federal government is implementing new strategies to ensure the success and sustainability of school feeding program as part of a reform ordered by the President. While addressing participants at a two-day strategic stakeholders meeting on the roadmap to the future implementation of school feeding program in Nigeria, Adeniji said the current administration has assessed the initial commitment and national plans for the school feeding program and identified areas of improvement. Adeniji emphasized the importance of stakeholders embracing the government's innovations and measures aimed at enhancing the program's implementation. Nigeria is facing a host of serious problems, including high unemployment, terrorism, poverty, obsolete educational system, and a high illiteracy rate. The cultural imbalance that exists in the country is also a major concern, with deep divisions between different ethnic and religious groups. The rate of unemployment in Nigeria is very high, especially among the youth, and this is leading to frustration and unrest. The poverty rate is also very high, with many people living in extreme poverty. In terms of education, the system is outdated and does not meet the needs of the modern world. In the meantime, the rising cost of building materials, inconsistency in Nigeria's forex market, plus the removal of fuel subsidy, Residents of the nation's capital have raised an alarm over the increasing costs of house rent. Now, some of those who spoke to News Central TV in Abuja said they no longer can cope and fear they may be rendered homeless soon. Marvelous Abomano brings us the special report from the nation's capital, Abuja. Abuja, Nigeria's capital, is the symbol of the nation's unity as people from diverse cultures, ethnicities, and religions now call it home. In recent times, staying in FCT is becoming untenable, as many say they cannot continue to service the high demands of landlords and estate developers. With the housing sector booming because of the high population of citizens, estate developers now hold sway, renting out houses to those who can afford to build their own. Many of them living off tenants. In Abuja, Nigeria's capital, residents are expressing worry over the high cost of accommodation. For those who cannot afford to pay house rent within the city centers, end up coming to local communities where they can afford cheaper accommodation. Where I am is called Mpape, a suburb of the federal capital territory. Now, when you look around this environment, you'll be forced to ask yourself, how good or comfortable will it be to get an accommodation in this kind of place? You are about to find out. This place is the most horrible place a man can live, in terms of dumping of refuse, and also in terms of sanitation, because the gutters are just close to your doorsteps if you are living in face me and face you. And also, it depends where you get your accommodations. Some places you find that the toilet is just right inside the compound. When it comes to the hygiene here, it's quite poor. It's very, very poor. And um, for someone who is thinking of, is looking at the hygiene, uh, the hygiene aspect of it here, I'm not sure you would want to stay in someone somewhere like this. Like, you can see around me here, you can see the drainage system is quite poor. Uh, you can see refuse being is just exposed to the environment. This is very bad pollution already. As residents in the suburbs express worry over the rising cost of accommodation, the situation is the same for their counterparts who reside within the city centers. The way the, way the real estate company and landlords 
are making house expensive, like accommodation expensive here in Abuja. I don't think the layman can stay in Abuja. You understand? For instance, staying in an apartment that you pay 700000 annually per year and an increment, we know, okay, yeah, we know the country is hard, the economy is bad, everybody's going through one or two situations and all. You understand? But as a landlord, you need to be considerate also. The accommodation in Abuja is terrible, seriously terrible. If you are earning, like, let me tell you, I'm a civil servant now, I'm working. If you are earning less than, at least less than 200 or 200 and above, you can't be able to stay in Abuja because the high cost of living in terms of accommodation is very high. In the course of our investigation, News Central identified one tenant who lost his life following bouts of depression as his house rent in the Guarimpa area of the city was increased from 800,000 Naira to 1.7 million Naira, an increase of over 200%. He was my breath. <laughs> that they took my breath away. I'm talking, it's not me that is talking. I don't know. I don't know. I just woke up one morning and uh, we saw uh, letters pasted on our doors, you know, for those that weren't around. Us that were around, I received mine, you know. And, uh, you know, looking at the content of the letter, we saw over a 100% increase on what we usually pay. Tenants in the apartment say the notice of increase came as a shock. However, there was more bad news as the troubled neighbor absent-mindedly found himself run over by a truck while in deep thought along the road. And I never knew about the letter. I never got uh, the chance to, to, to tell me. So when I go to his house, that is where I am right now, that was when his co-neighbors now brought out a letter. All of them, there were like seven, eight of them, brought his own letter to me and said, Mommy, this was what Tokwe got this morning that made him upset minded i said what and i read it i saw the the, the content of the letter very disturbing very highly professional we usually do this stuff like we write tenants agreements and we give to people so we usually include a rent review clause in the event the landlord intend to increase the rent so uh, i read the notice to say the least it is very oppressive how can you increase the rent from 800,000 to a 1 million 700,000? It is illogical. The mother of the disease said she has tried to reach out to the landlord and the lawyer who served the notice, but they have refused to grant her audience. Many residents will be hoping that something is done as quick as possible to arrest the exploitation of tenants by landlords in the federal capital. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Oboman. You're live with News Central TV. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. In North Central Nigeria, Residents of Jaws, capital of Plateau State, have urged the government to wade into the harsh economic situation that currently defines the daily lives of Nigerians. Shizoba Anyonwe was at Terminus Market in the state capital and sent in this report. My own lobby say always to come in to come and ask what is happening in the market, what is happening in the market, and no solution. Me, I don't want to be, be talking any time again. I don't go talk any time again. If there's no solution, any time when I come to this market, I don't know near me. This is one of the many issues Nigeria's economic meltdown over the past few months has brought on the table. Protests have been held in some cities. Government has also made some promises, but the effects are far from being seen. Except for a few wealthy people, which is insignificant in number, most Nigerians are now united in the same struggle of meeting up with soaring prices with diminishing income. This thing is painful. 
and they were always talking about this. Nobody will say he listen to us. Now come to market and say we talk and talk and talk and no nothing come out. He pay me higher cost too much. See Ugu where you go buy two thousand, then go tell you say na ten thousand. You know cost. Ugu see where we they buy and say two thousand, then go tell you say five thousand. You know cost. By this time, Kevin is supposed to be seventy thousand. Normal, normal, normal price, but now it's one hundred twenty thousand. So nothing is easy. Comparing the cost of food stuffs a few months ago with what is on the ground today paints a picture of what the reality is. But I'm serving till I die. Now I have to serve. No matter how things go, God will lead me to my destination. God will help me. The salary, of course, has not been increased for, you know, a number of years. Um, and of course, whatever you receive now, given the high cost of foreign currency, particularly the dollar, the salary you were receiving two, three years ago uh, cannot even buy half of, um, you know, what you used to buy. That is in this present uh, economy. What this pertains for our country and the economy may not be palatable. There is a hope. Hope is if the government really wants to do the right thing. The one advantage of the subsidy withdrawal is that a lot of revenue hmm, is accrued to the government. Government is getting a lot of money because of that subsidy. Those, those wastages well, are no more there. Now, what do you do with the wastage? The, the, the extra money we, you now get, once they are channeled properly, that will be it. It is no longer news how bad the cost of living has become in Nigeria. Here in Plateau State, it is not a different case as other parts of the country are also feeling the same pain. Now what they ask for is that government at all levels do what is necessary and very fast to improve the means of livelihood of citizens. In JAWS for New Central, I am Chizwaba Anyong. In 2012, the United Nations General Assembly designated February 6 as the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation, aiming to amplify and direct the efforts to eliminate this practice. With a the theme, Her Voice, Her Future, the government, non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations and communities must lend their voice to making sure they protect the sexuality of young girls and women. According to UN, despite this, in 2024, Nearly 4.4 million girls or more than 12,000 each day are at risk of FGM around the world. And to talk about this in detail, I'm joined live in the studio by Odunola Ola Binton, medical practitioner and founder, The Health City. It's a pleasure to have you join me. Thank you so much for having me on the news today. All right. What would you say are the main drivers of female genital mutilation in Africa? I mean, is it cultural, religious, or even economic? Well, I would say it's mostly cultural, right? Because our people believe that uh, female genital mutilation is actually helpful when it is actually not. So um, FGM, as in short form, is deeply rooted in culture. And you'll find that in Nigeria, it's not only Yoruba people that practice it. You find there are some parts of um, um, some evil people do too, and it's common in the north too. And there are four types of um, FGM, and you'll find that there are different types being practiced by different cultures. So um, for Yoruba culture, they believe that um, if a girl child is not caught, she would be promiscuous, right? There are some other cultures that also believe that if a girl child is not caught, when she wants to give birth, if the end of the child touches the clitoris, the child will die. Really, really ridiculous reason sometimes, but it's a practice that is rooted in culture that people really believe is effective. So that's why sometimes uh, in the past it was difficult to deal with, but uh, you know, intervention has been going on and it's getting better. Mm. Now, Dr. Oduola, let's talk about you know, some of the negative you know, health implications of FGM for women and girls in our society. What are they? Okay, so FGM has both short-term complications and long-term complications. So short-term will include when the act is performed immediately, like um, bleeding, excessive bleeding that can lead to shock, and in rare cases, like in really terrible cases, can lead to death. Then you can have infection, because this, um, this practice is not usually done 
in a clean environment. It's done by traditional cutters who use things like blades. Some people use the um, shell of a snail, right? So when they do that, it can lead to infection. And some long-term complications also can be um, urinary problem, you know, um, fibrosis in that area when the healing doesn't um, go as planned. Um, in, in, in cases of women that even had infibulation or um, done, they can have difficulty um, during childbirth, they can have infertility problems. The, the problems that FGM cause, very numerous. Mm. But are there really policy frameworks in place to end FGM? I mean, how effective have they been so far? Okay, so there's a law, right? Nigeria has a law to end female genital mutilation. But, you know, having a law and implementing the law is, there are two different things, right? There are states in Nigeria that have taken the law seriously, that have implemented, that have, um, was cool. They have um, adopted the law into their own um, state laws, like Ekiti State, um, where you know um, there's actual and active drive. So um, there's a law, but there needs to be an act, a continual drive. Yeah, the government is trying, and um, you know the State Ministry of Health are also trying, but. Um, there needs to be um, a lot of talk about implementing the law so people will know that when you caught your girl child, you can actually go to prison for it. Okay, let's talk about your success uh, stories uh, so far. Uh, what outreach efforts have you made that, that has been successful, you know, so far in time past or recently? Okay, so previously I used to volunteer for um, UNICEF, UNFPA joint program to end female genital mutilation. And I was on that program for a couple of years. So what we used to do is that we did both online and physical advocacy to end FGM. So we would do online tweet chats, would you know, um, would um, have you know webinars, town halls online to educate people about FGM. And people would say, oh wow, I never knew about this. And then we we'll also go to, you know, we also used to do physical programs and uh, where we would go to villages and towns and, you know, educate them about the practice and why it needs to stop. And we even got, you know, some of those people to do like a public declaration that they were no longer doing FGM. Now, that program is still going forward, even though I'm no longer part of it. And there are several other NGOs that are continually working on it. I primarily focus on health education these days. So I'm still, you know, also educating people, telling them about FGM and why the practice needs to stop. All right. Finally, Dr. Dorola, how can communities be empowered, you know, to collaborate and eliminate FGM in our society? So education is key, right? Uh, sometimes, and you know, in Nigeria at the time, they were killing twins. I mean, if you didn't know that something was wrong, you will know that you need to stop it. So uh, we need to intensify efforts to educate people. And also, there are people whose jobs it is to actually cut people. Like, that's their job, right? In, in, that, in that regard, you need to, you know, find another vocation for these people and just, you know, intensify education, about, for, especially for mothers and grandfathers, and also men, right? So you can't leave anybody else. When you're talking about FGM, some fathers don't know that their, their mothers are the ones that encourage their daughters to be cut. Like, so we can't leave anybody out of the education, men, uh, women, religious bodies, everybody. So education is a key driver. All right, that's a fine place to wrap up. Dr. Odunola Olabinto, thank you so much for your expertise and, of course, your kind company on the news. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And coming up, Defence Minister visits troops in Goma amidst increased fighting. We'll bring you details of these when we get back. Stay with us. Nigeria is facing a host of serious problems, including high unemployment, terrorism, poverty, obsolete educational system, and high illiteracy rates. The cultural imbalance existing in the country is a major concern, with deep divisions between different ethnic and religious groups. The rate of unemployment in Nigeria is very high, especially among youth, and this is leading to frustration and unrest. The poverty rate is also very high, with many people living in extreme poverty. In terms of education, the system is outdated and does not meet the needs of the modern world. And to talk about this in detail, I'm being joined live on the news by Okpo Olua Taiwo, Financial Analyst and Executive Director, Africa Bridge Initiative. It's a pleasure to have you join me. Good afternoon. Um, can you hear me, Okmaulua, if you're there? And moving on to another story, 
With the aim of driving systematic changes, normative and cultural shifts while promoting healthy relationships, the Lagos State Government, through Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency, has tasked religious leaders on the need to give proper premarital counseling to intending couples by providing them with relevant information before enforcing the marriage contract. Bettina Unwili has details. According to data from the DSVA 2022 report, it is revealed that financial dependency, third-party interference, lack of communication, lack of sexual satisfaction, unrealistic expectation, and infidelity were identified as triggers contributing to domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Furthermore, according to the Executive Secretary of the Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency of Lagos State, Nigeria, Mrs. Titilola Vaivo Adeni, about 70% of survivors that reported to DSVA disclosed that they had previously reported to their pastors or imams before coming to report to the DSVA. The way we're engaging religious clerics is the way we're engaging um, community leaders, traditional rulers, and everybody that has one role or the other to play in the community. And the truth is that this happens Sexual and gender-based violence is not a respect of age, class, creed, or even religion. Anybody can perpetrate it, and anybody can be a victim or survivor. And so it's important for us to engage religious clerics from this um, perspective. We're not castigating anybody. We know the important role they play in shaping belief systems. We know that sometimes they even serve as first responders. And so it's important for us to let them know of the relevant laws that exist, let them know the support services that exist that the member of, a member of their congregation may want to take advantage of. We are against the rapist. We all have the right to say no. We are saying no to raping. We're saying no to uh, abuse of our humanity. We want the freedom. We want those people that are involved to so please stop. We are all saying no and we don't want it anymore. Vaivo Adeni emphasized that in light of the rising concern, the agency recognized the crucial roles that religious institutions play in the formation of marriages and the sustainability of families. As a result, the agency found it necessary to consult with religious leaders about the strategic position of religious institutions in premarital counseling for intending couples from a preventive perspective before taking the big step into marriage. Creating an enabling environment for our church members uh, where they can talk, they can actually confide in you, they can open up because a whole lot of people are dying in silence. And they, we, are creating, we have created an environment that is not that too good, that makes them feel uh, uncomfortable to say the truth, to open up. If you're going through something, there should be a counseling section of the church whereby you can actually walk in and uh, confide in the priest or in the man of God or even in the wife of the man of God. Through like Nesfat, we are collaborating with a lot of organizations, the Qatar Center, some, some renowned organizations, and we are campaigning against violence, against women and gay, all forms of gender-based violence, violence against women and gay, Anything that can make marriage to become hell, we campaign against it in Nazareth and Levati. We are getting support from various organizations to advance that cause. Religious leaders are in a strong position to work with their congregation to address the harmful cultural practices that perpetuate negative gender norms and harm women and girls' health and safety. Working with, rather than against, religious leaders in Nigeria is crucial to ending violence against women and girls and promoting women empowerment. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nguyen. The news continues in West Africa, where Nigerian Beninese Advocacy Group has called for a Nigerian Benin Permanent Joint Commission to help tackle challenges between both countries as well as promote trade and cultural relations. The groups who are making the call at Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Abuja said both countries can benefit immensely from the commission, which will have tremendous benefits to citizens. Amadine Uye reports. With relations spanning hundreds of years prior to independence, Nigeria and Benin Republic share a lot in common through historical collaboration and cultural affiliation. 
crisscrossing several states of the country, there lies immense benefits for a Nigeria being in collaboration, especially through the establishment of a permanent joint commission. The establishment of the proposed Nigeria and Benin Republic Joint Commission is quite apt and important in leveraging the existing warm relation between the two countries to a strategic level, partnership, which will manifest itself in building robust and sustainable people-to-people -people and business-to-business -business relations among the people of Nigeria and, uh, and Benin Republic. As the Nigerian Beninese Advocacy Group visited the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Abuja, they say several opportunities are bound for both countries that have remained untapped and can be effectively exploited if a permanent joint commission is established between both nations. They say this is evident through several joint commissions in place between Nigeria and other nations. This proposal has been inspired by the successes of existing permanent joint commission between Nigeria and her neighboring countries, specifically uh, Niger Republic. We know that we are having a little crisis, but that crisis will have escalated more if there are no structure and institution of a permanent uh, commission, joint commission between the two countries. We know what that permanent commission has been doing. The Minister of Foreign Affairs commended the initiative, however informed the group that a joint commission already exists, though it has not been as active as expected. This issue of the Nigeria Benin Joint Commission is one that is on the front burner. It's something that we have been uh, discussing. But it's also important to note uh, from our records here that a Nigeria Benin Joint Commission does exist. It's just gone uh, uh, silent. It's already in existence. It went sort of. Um, I wouldn't want to use the, the word comatose, but for lack of a better word, it um, slowed down in 2014, and it's one that needs to be resuscitated. He says the commission can help the sub-region address several challenges affecting both nations like insecurity and underdevelopment. The issue of uh, security is increasingly tied to deficiencies in development, in uh, standards of living, in border areas, because this is where um, uh, sometimes insurgencies and, uh, and, and, uh, and unrest uh, hide to, to incubate and then come up. Nigeria shares a 778 kilometer land and maritime border with Benin Republic. This transverses the six states of Lagos, Ogo, Oyo, Kwara, Ninja, and Kebi. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Tell you that the president, Patrice Talon of Benin Republic, has denied plans to review the constitution of the West African. Addressing a press conference in Kotonu, Talon promised to oppose the revision of the constitution. Je ne demande aucune révision et je me poserai à la révision de la Constitution. Par les moyens qui me sont permis, en disant non, il ne faut pas le faire. Et puis euh, euh, maintenant, euh, s'ils si le font comme je suis un démocrate et que ça s'impose à moi, je, mais je m'acharnerai à faire les, en sorte que ce que je trouve pas bien ne se fasse pas. Donc, un, à la limite, ne pas réviser. C'est moi mon, mon choix de ne pas toucher la Constitution. Deux, que les modifications à faire soient conformes à l'esprit de la Constitution et à l'éthique. Que le moment est arrivé pour faire le point, savoir si les mesures qui ont été prises ont produit leurs effets ou non. Qu'on ne sait pas des, des mesures qui sont destinées à durer dans le temps parce que ça pose des préjudices graves aux populations. Il faut être réaliste. Donc, ma position aujourd'hui, euh, et si j'ai l'occasion de l'exprimer au sein de la conférence des chefs d'État, je le dirai, C'est qu'il faut le, tout laisser tomber. Que veulent les Maliens, c'est OK. Que veulent que les, 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 que veulent les, les, les Burkinabés, c'est OK. Que veulent les Nigériens, c'est OK pour que cette décision de séparer les peuples n'aille pas plus loin que l'intention ou à la déclaration. On peut dire, le dire, revenir.
We head to Senegal, where presidential candidates have approached the Supreme Court in Dakar to lodge an appeal seeking the annulment of President Macky Sall's decree to postpone the presidential election ballot originally scheduled for February 25. Aujourd'hui, apporter un début de solution, mais je ne pense pas que ce soit la seule. Mais c'était à faire. On pourrait penser qu'il y, qu y aurait peut-être encore un peu de justice dans notre pays, on n'est pas sûr. Mais au moins, on va le faire parce qu'il faut le faire. Mais la bataille qui va sans doute faire réagir M. le Président Macky Sall, c'est la bataille populaire. Et qui met en danger la stabilité du pays. C'est pour cela que nous avons conçu des avocats pour l'attaquer. Parce que Macky Sall est en train d'enfreindre toutes les lois et particulièrement la Constitution. Pour la durée du mandat et le nombre de mandats, la Constitution ne peut pas être modifiée. C'est pour ça, ça qu'il est absolument essentiel que nous obtenions l'annulation de ce décret, ce qui redonnerait vigueur ipso facto au décret qui a convaincu le corps électoral et relancerait le processus électoral. The Air Congo's Defense Minister, Jean Pere Bemba, has visited Goma to offer his support to the armed forces and the population affected by the fighting. The situation remains tense in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where fighting has intensified in recent days between government forces and the M23 rebellion. Thousands of panicked inhabitants of Sake, a town considered strategic on the road to Goma, fled on Wednesday to escape the bombardment adding to the hundreds of thousands of displaced people already crowded on the outskirts of North Kivu capital. La population, qu'elle puisse être sereine, le chef de l'État ne dort pas, le commandant suprême ne dort pas, il jour et nuit, il suit la situation ici, et comme je vous le dis, tout est mis en œuvre au niveau de nos forces armées pour pouvoir en faire en sorte que, que ce soit Saké, soit Goma, et que ce soit protégé, et que tous les territoires qui appartiennent à la RDC, au Tchourou, Massissi, puissent être libérés. C'est un message de réconfort, de soutien, également à nos forces armées, à nos amis euh, des forces qui sont ici présentes, la SADEC, les compagnies privées qui sont ici, nos frères Wazalendo qui se battent également, que nous félicitons. You're live with News Central TV. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Lunar New Year, one of the most important celebrations in Asian culture, marks the beginning of the New Year calendar year with family gatherings and a day of rest. It's also known as Chinese New Year or Spring Festival. It is celebrated by millions all across the world. Lunar New Year starts February 10 and ends with Lantern Festival on February 24. In China, the public holiday will last from February 10 to 17 this year. The Chinese zodiac or Sheng Shaiyo is repeating 12 year cycle of animal signs and their attributes based on the lunar calendar. The lunar new year marks the transition from one animal to another, and this year is known as the year of the dragon. The White House has launched a fierce pushback against a brutal special counsel report portraying Joe Biden as elderly and forgetful. The White House described it as a political hit job on the president in, a, in an election year. The vice president called these on inappropriate in an address to the National Rifle Association event. A former president, Donald Trump, portrayed Biden as elderly and forgetful. The investigation declared the 81-year-old Democrat illegally retaining classified documents in his home and garage, but damningly branded him as a well-meaning elderly man with poor memory. If Biden is not going to be charged, he said, that's up to them. You know, look, if he's not going to be charged, that's up to them. But then I should not be charged. This is nothing more. And now to business stories. Nigeria is an import-dependent nation, yet not a shipping nation, despite its huge contribution to global trade, playing marginally in the industry. It is on record that no fewer than 90% of shipping companies owned by Nigerians have either completely shut down their operations or barely struggling to survive. 
with an estimated annual cargo support of 150 million metric tons generated and with freight earnings in excess of $5 billion in international trade transactions, 95% of this income is earned by foreigners with job deprivation to a lot of Nigerians. The same dominance by foreigners is also extended to domestic shipping market where an estimated $3 billion annual marine-related spending in the oil and gas production activities are virtually earned by foreigners. Look at the number of vessels that call in the Nigerian ports. Enormous. And are they Nigerian-owned vessels? No. Are they crewed by Nigerians? No. Are they owned by Nigerians? No. So that is a, 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 a big a big part of investment that they need to look into. With this, you would we can you have the numbers. Look at the numbers. Ninety-five percent of what comes into this economy is through the marine and blue economy. So I think the minister needs to look in depth to as to how we can channel investment or maybe the PPP private partnership. There are a lot of indigenous who also have funds to invest, but because they don't have clear understanding mm. of these policies, mm. they don't know, oh, if I invest in this, will another policy not come tomorrow? Will another ministry not come tomorrow? And it's over. So we need, the minister needs to sit down, look at these things, put together. What are I'll find out more about how we can increase indigenous participation and end foreign dominance in the shipping sector. Watch a Maritime Radar on Saturday, 7 p.m., and a repeat broadcast on Sunday at 1 p.m. on News Central TV. And that's all on the news of this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Airline operators lament surge in price of fuel and unfriendly environments. Presidential candidates in Senegal have lodged an appeal against the late election. And finally, we told you that DR Congo's defense minister has visited armed forces in Goma amidst increasing fighting. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV, Channel 422, Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.